what would the world look like if society acknowledged and embraced more than two genders, male and female? That's one of the critical questions explored in Joshua M. Ferguson's new book, Me, Myself, They, Life Beyond the Binary. Ferguson was the first Ontarian to receive an ex-non-binary designation on their birth certificate and continues to seek creative challenges to what they see as the cultural construct of gender. And Joshua M. Ferguson joins us now for more. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's very nice to meet you. Thank I really you. enjoyed your book. Thank you. Thank um, you for having me here. So uh, you identify as non-binary. Um, explain to us what that means. So I like to say, I get this question a lot, mm -hmm. of course, and I like to say that um, it may mean uh, something different for me, right? Mm -hmm. That my definition of non-binary might not apply to all non-binary people. So for me, what non-binary means is that I don't identify exclusively as a man or a woman. Um, and uh, that, you know, all trans people are not the same. And, you know, the trans, gender non-conforming and uh, non-binary community is quite diverse it would be easy to see me as a spokesperson for the community, right? Or to, for me to bear the burden of representation for the entire community. And I do, I'm not the spokesperson. I'm one of so many people in the community who have these stories to tell, right? Who advocate for our existence. And so um, it's much more complex than uh, you know, one person one doing definition. the work or one definition. Um, you know, there's more diversity and, uh, and there's sort of more richness to our community than that. Well, you write in the book, um, I want to be and I am hybrid, multiple, part man, part woman, part something else. Yes. Uh, beyond what simple language can capture. Yes. Uh, do you see this as a new way to define gender or to think of gender, moving away from definitions? I think gender actually defies a sort of stable, coherent definition. Mm -hmm. When we think about what gender means, because gender um, uh, in, sort of encompasses gender identity, gender expression, sex. Um, and so all of those things, um, gender identity and gender expression are certainly different things, right? Gender is, identity is how we feel and gender expression is how we perform, behave, mm -hmm. express ourselves in the world. So. In a way, um, gender is quite difficult to define because it's always um, in, you have to uh, understand it in relation to time and place. So where you are in the world or in terms of historical context, mm -hmm. because it changes. Our notion of gender has changed um, over the course of time and our language continues to evolve. And so, you know, I think there's one thing that's certain about my identity and, and why non-binary makes sense for me now. What's that? And that's um, the fluid uh, aspect of it. Mm. And I think that we have reduced ourselves as human beings to such simple terms to understand one another, right? Mm. Um, we've categorized ourselves and in a way that's created divisions where we see everything as one or the other. It doesn't just apply to gender. Mm -hmm. So the fluid sort of aspect of my identity, I think, is much more um, similar to what a lot of us feel mm -hmm. throughout our lives. We change and we evolve as people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I am open to where that evolution might take me, um, having a fluid subjectivity in the future. Um, and that openness and that sort of the possibility for, you know, growth. Um, I may not, you know, express my gender the same way in a few months from now, and that may change. I may start to identify my gender a little bit differently. Um, but you should have the freedom to be able to I do that. I should have the freedom to be, we should all have mm -hmm. the freedom to be who, who we are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't harm or threaten anyone else. Mm -hmm. And just to pick up on the uh, on that, something we've been hearing a lot is uh, born this way. Yes. Um, and it's become a rallying call for the LGBTQ community. Yes. But you say that you haven't always been very comfortable, is that fair to say, mm -hmm. with that phrase? Mm -hmm. um, how come? I think, um, well, I also want to say, you know, again, 
it, you know, this is my story and my sort of opinion about it, but um, and and how I feel, and certainly um, being born this way for a lot of us, um, I do think that I was born um, with you know sort of queer sexual identity for sure. Um, but in terms of my gender identity, I do think that um, you know we come into this world being assigned a sex right at birth. Um, and, and with that, we're assigned our gender um, that correlates with our sex. So we're meant to be, you know, for assigned male at birth, we're meant to be masculine right away and, and a boy and then a man, you know. And uh, because I've experienced my identity shifting and changing through my life, I'm not so sure that I was born with an idea of my gender identity. Because I think gender identity and the way we understand gender is so, um, has such a deep connection with culture, right? And so, for example, the gender binary is really like a colonial mindset, right? So part of deconstructing that is deconstructing this sort of colonial enlightenment idea of categorizing people and doing away with sort of cultural diversity. Um, so, so the born this way um, concept um, and this need to sort of confess our identities, right? In order to be considered to be legitimate uh, subjects in society. Um, I'm not so sure that it necessarily makes sense for me because that would mean that I have a sort of stable, coherent, you know, permanent identity throughout my life. Um, and I think for some of us, it's more fluid than that. Right. When um, speaking of when you were born and yes. they, you, were, you were identified as male, um, and you fought to have that change on your birth certificate. Well, I was actually, um, uh, well, funny for, enough. Well, you, in this, funny in the book, enough, you, the yeah. doctor actually um, thought you I were a girl. Start the book. I start me myself, self day with that. Mm -hmm. The doctor said it's a girl, and then and then paused. And, and your parents came up some with a name. Suspense in the room. Yeah. yeah, I was named Kate. Yes. And uh, and then and then the doctor said it's a, it's a boy, uh, and then the name was changed. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was kind of a forecast mm -hmm. of what my life would be like. And yeah. now it's come full circle in a way. Well, you became the first Ontarian to um, have an X to change your birth certificate. Right. Um, why was that important for you to do? Um, it was important because I needed identity documents that reflected the truth of who I am. Mm -hmm. And for me, being boxed into male or female on my identity documents never felt good. And I experienced a lot of embarrassment and ridicule, laughs, funny looks, whenever I presented my ID with an M for simple things like going to the post office or the liquor store. I mean, it, ex it exposed me to a lot of uncomfortable situations almost on a daily basis. And so, you know, I knew that that was important for me. Did I set out to do that to make a larger point? Um, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. I did it for myself. Um, certainly a year ago, it felt like a victory for the members of my community that would want that, that um, designation on their identification. But I also like to, I don't really like to, I like to push back a little bit on being the first mm -hmm. because I think we're so used to in our society to sort of elevate some voices, right? And I have a lot of privilege mm -hmm. as a white trans person. And so the voices that we often elevate sometimes reflect that privilege. And I have to acknowledge the rich history of my community and the people who have come before me and who you know, are in my community now fighting and paving the path. So although I was the first in Ontario, I was certainly not the first in many ways mm -hmm. because I'm here today you know, with this book 
thanks to the generations of truth tellers before me and, mm -hmm. and who exists now and all of the, you know, black, indigenous, people of color in our trans community who are doing such incredible work. You're, you're very generous um, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of self-awareness. Um, where did that begin? Like, where does that come from? When you're a kid who, I was very free as a child up until um, about age eight. And um, as soon as I stepped outside of the home, um, I had very good, I have very good parents who allowed me to be who I was. But as soon as I started to step out of the home and into, you know, the internal sort of space or the external spaces like schools and institutions and systems and, you know, society, pieces of me were ripped away from me. And in order to gather those pieces again and put myself back together, which is essentially what Me, Myself, They is about, it's about putting myself back together again. I, I feel like I'm... <laughs> I'm a sensitive person, um, but knowing what I know about some of the things that you've gone through um, in your book, um, I have two small kids. And you write about your parents. Um, the situation wasn't always perfect, but um, you know, you say that, um, you know, you write about the challenges that they faced in trying to help yes. you navigate yes. the world, especially when other people were telling them yes. what was going on with you yes. or what was wrong with you. Um, yeah. What do you say to parents who are watching this, whether or not they have a child with uh, a non-binary identity? I think parents with any children, um, you know, it's probably what I found through telling my story is, you know, transforming my, my trauma into creativity, empathy, and strength. Um, and real, I had a realization that we're more similar than we are different from one another. And we often think that, you know, in the narratives of trans people that they're so different from cis people. And I think what we should really understand is that we all face similar struggles. And kids, um, whether they're LGBTQ, um, two-spirit, um, many kids face issues of bullying and dehumanization and marginalization and isolation in childhood. Um, and so I think the experience that my parents went through and, and raising a child who was, you know, severely marginalized and bullied and tormented, um, I think my message, message wouldn't just be to um, parents with trans kids, mm -hmm. it would be to parents with, with kids. Mm -hmm. Um, who m may be unique or eccentric or, you know, may have a marginalized identity um, and uh, of any sort, you know, um, in terms of intersectional uh, difference, that um, to just be there for your child, mm -hmm. to be there for your child, to show up for your child in whatever form they may take, whoever they might be, Allow them to be who they are. Never tell them who to be, you know? And be very cautious about the systems trying to um, conform a child to who, to what the system thinks a child should be. Mm -hmm. Because children bring a lot of magic and creativity and compassion with them when they come into this world. And I think it's a really powerful thing when we allow children just to be who they are. I want to talk about pronouns. Um, you, uh, you write this about pronouns. Yes. Uh, pronouns are of vital importance to trans people because they are one of the primary agents of autonomy and social recognition that we have. Yes. The failure to use a person's pronouns or repeated misuse of pronouns is called misgendering. And if the person doing the misgendering is intentionally enacting harm and harassing a trans person by using incorrect pronouns to insist that they adhere to their sex and gender assigned at birth, this could be classified as a form of transphobic violence enacted on trans people. Um, I've seen this a lot, especially on social media, um, where people, you know, say violence is 
you know, physical. Um, right. How can trans? How can it be violence for someone to say something or to use the pr wrong pronouns? Well, I think I have a lot to say about pronouns in the book, and um, I actually don't think that misgendering most of the time is violent or malicious. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that there are cases of misgendering where it is uh, uh, malicious and the person doing the misgendering is intentionally trying to dehumanize the trans person. Um, and it is a form of violence because it strips us of who we are. And so, but I also say a lot about pronouns in terms of the cultural conditioning that we're all that we all go through. And this sort of, you know, wiring of our brains to think in the binary and nothing else. And I think the pronoun um, issue has sort of been magnified as the most, one of the, the sort of most important things about trans people and our identities. Mm -hmm. It is certainly a part of our experience. And for a lot of us, it's an important part of, you know, opening up to our families and our friends and our communities um, to have them, you know, properly acknowledge our identities. But it's not the biggest thing. And I, I am forgiving about misgendering because I feel that the adjustment when it comes to language is something that a lot of people struggle with. My parents, for example, have known my pronouns for almost four years now, and they still make mistakes. You my, even write your husband. My husband still makes mistakes. Right. Good friends of mine still makes mista make mistakes. So people will make mistakes. I sometimes make mistakes about other trans people. So we're all human. We all make mistakes, but but the. Really, when we make a mistake, we need to own up to it. We need to acknowledge it. We need to then apologize because it's really not about if I misgender a trans person by accident. It's not about me. It's about that trans person. And often what happens is we start to think about ourselves in that moment. It's embarrassing. And we start to feel embarrassed feel shame, yeah. and we feel, feel ashamed and we feel, you know, um, nervous. Or we feel defensive and because it's defensive. like, oh, we're trying. Or exactly. And so instead of that, we need to just acknowledge it mm -hmm. and apologize, say it again, because I find that that's kind of like a rewiring, right, of like our pathways in our brain, like just to say it again. Um, and move on. Do you think too, uh, I know you're not speaking for the whole community. Yes, no, I'm not. Um, but when we have uh, they, yes. uh, because we already use it so much uh, to refer to something else. We do. Um, and yes. then the grammar, you know, yes. like, do you think that maybe we need another word um, in place of they or? I do, th there are other gender neutral pronouns. Mm -hmm. They, them, theirs has been, has been used in our lexicon for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually used a lot more hundreds of years ago, and I think it's it's sort of re-emerging, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's sort of widely accepted now um, uh, by many institutions as, uh, and I think, you know, it's really just thinking about it. I know it's the singular versus plural thing that people have a hard time with, and um, but we do use they, them, there for us, uh, for an individual, uh, in ways that, that we don't a lot more than we realize. Right. You know what I mean? Again, you just you, we, we just have it, to read, and, and 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 we don't even realize we've said it. Yeah. And many people use it, right. so it's just about a consciousness shift mm -hmm. and making right? ourselves and uncomfortable. And making ourselves, it's a little maybe a yeah. little bit uncomfortable. Right. Um, but a consciousness shift just to respect us. And to see. As fellow human yeah. beings, you know, it's really not so much to ask. We only have a few minutes and I really want to yeah, talk about please. your uh, your art. Okay, um, great. How, how did you become a filmmaker? Um, well, I knew I, in the story, and me, myself, they, I, I, I referenced a, a story where I was in my early 20s and I was starting college after, you know, some really, some struggles with education and 
finding myself again after being tormented so much throughout high school and realizing that I always felt like I was sort of born into this world to affect people, Mm -hmm. to reach people, to connect with people. And so I was in a sort of introductory media arts program at Algonquin College and it clicked then. And then when I went to Western University and studied film study, enrolled in film studies in a more formal sense, started to learn about the mechanics behind this incredible art form that touches all of us. And I mean, who doesn't love movies? Um, I realized that filmmaking was my, my sort of greatest chance at affecting people. Mm. Um, And so my husband and I, fortunately, my husband uh, also had that dream. Mm. And we formed our production company and we've we've made films and we have now feature films in development. And, uh, you know, but I like to say that I'm a filmmaker, um, an artist, um, and and a writer now, um, and I've written this memoir, um, but I also have a, a second book that I'm writing, mm-hmm. a young al- adult fantasy fiction. So, um, well, what inspires you most in your creative work? What inspires me most are stories that haven't been told yet. Mm-hmm. Um, for example. I want to write fantasy because I often find that in science fiction or fantasy works, um, there is such a sort of, um, and I don't want to generalize, but often a sort of boring, um, unrealistic uh, representation Mm -hmm. of what sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexuality would look like in 200 years from now or in some sort of fantasy realm. And so I want to bring everything I know about about that Mm -hmm. um, to those realms because I think we need more works. We need more films and books that reflect the reality of our existence, the diversity of our society. Mm -hmm. So that's what really kind of to sort of I call myself an alchemist too, because it's kind of like combining like myself, the matter of myself, and then the matter of my art, and then the matter of sort of the stuff of society and just sort of like mixing them together to create something new. Great. Um, We have 30 seconds left, and I just want to ask you one more, uh, one last question. Okay. Um, What would you say to uh, young Joshua at eight years old? Um, Because in the book, that seemed to be a pivotal uh, point in time for you. It's such a tough question, you know, Um, because I've recently reclaimed little Joshua and I would say, um, that, you know, stay true to who you are. Um, Don't let the darkness take you. Continue moving to the light, even though it may be getting smaller and smaller. Um, And never stop looking up at the stars. Joshua, it's been great meeting you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And what a terrific book. Thank Uh, you. Looking forward to the other book that you're going to write. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.